this uh, video is about how I accidentally started a comic book business in the early 19, middle 1960s, I guess, uh, when I was a child, about eight years old, <clears throat> and was terrible at it, and never made any money, actually probably lost hundreds of thousands of dollars in the, what their value would be today. And I have hardly any comics now. I do have some more besides the four I have here. But I have recently moved and I can't find any others. Although I had them six months ago when I looked through them. I'll open each of these, but I want to tell you a little bit about the uh, the story. It's kind of a memoir, I guess. My parents were both born in the early 1930s. And as they grew up, they read comic books. My mom always told me that, <coughs> excuse me, her favorites were what, in what we would now call the golden age of comics, the 1940s, uh, her favorites were Plastic Man, Adam, and Wonder Woman. My dad's favorite was the 1940s Billy Batson, Captain Marvel. Now I think he's called Shazam. Neither of my parents were sentimental about comics, nor did they think about them as something worth selling. Comics were something to read, enjoy, then throw away. So I was lucky. Uh, they buy me comic books. As I grew up, uh, in fact, I was taught to read in the 1950s with comic books. Um, then my mom would routinely throw my comic books away after I had them a while and they started stacking up. So each month I obtained new comic books. I was disappointed when they went from 10 to 12 cents, but uh, I still bought them. I had to scrounge around. <coughs> Pennies, usually. Now, um, because I had comics, a lot of friends, some of that's in quotes, some were genuine friends, visited because they wanted to read my comic books. In 1964, one of these guys offered to buy, to buy a month-old comic book from me. And I remember uh, what it was. It was, <clears throat> and I looked it up to confirm my memory. DC Comics, The Brave and the Bold, number 54, the first story of what would later be called the Teen Titans. So I said I'd think about it. So my other friends heard about this, and they also offered to buy it. Now, my dad was a businessman, and he was out of town on business. So I would have asked my dad, but he wasn't there. So I told my mom several friends had offered to buy a comic book. However, no one would agree to pay more than a dime. It was a used comic, even though it was only a month old. I had spent 12 cents to buy the comic. <coughs> well, mom was busy cleaning and tidying and was dismissive of my childhood problem but she was very firm she said you might as well sell it because I'm throwing away some of your comics there's too many in your room if you sell it you'll get something out of it instead of nothing and I don't like your friends laying around our house reading comic books anyway so sell it otherwise it's going in the trash so I sold it for a dime in fact I sold 10 one-month-old comics I bought each for 12 cents. The way I viewed it, I had 10 new comics for one month of reading enjoyment, and that cost me two cents each instead of 12 cents. I felt I got a bargain and had the enjoyment of new comics for a month for two cents. And then, you know, I got a dime back. I bought 12, I got a dime. 
And so I got something instead of having my mom throw them away and I'd get nothing. So that became a regular practice. I'd buy 10 or 12 new comics at 12 cents each. Then after a month or two, I'd sell them for a dime each. My mom was happy the kids were no longer laying around our house reading comics. And I was happy that I was stacking up dimes. This went on for about a year until my dad saw me sell a 12 cent comic book looking new, it was a month old, 12 cent comic book I sold for a dime. He about had a heart attack. He about had a stroke. He was very upset. He launched into a very forcible lecture about capitalism and making a profit. I knew everything he was saying, but he would not let me interrupt and tell him that mom was going to throw the comics away and I'd get nothing. Mom wasn't kidding. She had been throwing away my comics, and there was no reasoning with it. And there was no reasoning with my dad either. He wouldn't listen. After that, my comic book commerce became a clandestine operation. Unfortunately, I couldn't always secretly get together with other kids to sell my comics. So each month I sold a few comics and mom threw away most of my other comics. There was a place on the broad headboard of my bed where she let me keep comics. If they didn't fit there or the stack got too high, she'd throw them away. <clears throat> it wasn't long before I started working in my aunt's bookstore and learned that some comics had real value. But my dad never learned that lesson. When I was offered, in front of my dad, I was offered $10 for Amazing Fantasy number 15, the first Spider-Man, Dad wouldn't listen. I knew it was worth a lot al already, even though it was only four years old. This was 1966, and the comic was published in 1962, Amazing Fantasy 15, The First Spider-Man. So I was crying, literally crying. Dad made me sell it for the offered $10. Now, I followed it for a while. That same comic later sold for $25,000 and has probably sold since then for much more. In May 1968, just right after I turned 12, my dad made me get a newspaper out so I could buy my own comics. He said I didn't understand the value of a dime, so I'd learn by hard work. I got up at 4.30 a.m. the next morning to go on my newspaper out. The story's very short. I never made any money at comics, even when I had valuable comics. Now this one, Spider-Man 16. Let's see, it is 1964. Written by Stan Lee, illustrated by Steve Ditko, lettered by Steve Rosen, Daredevil, Ringmaster, September. 1964, Daredevil's still in his old costume. Here's Daredevil number three, Fighting Owl. Let's see if I can open this without tearing it. Oh. So this one, also copyright 1964. August 1964. Number three, The Owl, Ominous Overlord of Crime, written with raw realism by Stan Lee, illustrated with daring drama by Joe Orlando, inked with actual artistry by Vince Coletta, lettered with perfect precision by Steve Rosen. Well, some of these I really don't know why I still have them. <clears throat> uh, I have, like I said, I've had anyway others. 
Okay, here's uh, uh, Strange Tales 158. July 1967. This is Nick Fury, Agent of S.H.I.E.L.D. I was going to sell this. I put a dime. I wrote that. That's supposed to be 10 cents. But, uh, yeah, that's right. Nobody wanted this one. Final Encounter with Baron Strucker. Charge of Hydra. I always thought it was a good comic. And it wasn't until, of course, later I learned why... There were two comics together. I was always puzzled by that. Well, actually, that's a long story I'm not going to get into, but it had to do with uh, publisher Martin Goodman making a bad business deal. Several bad business deals. Now, this one might actually be worth something, but there's one thing about it. I'd have to meet somebody who's willing to pay for it. And I don't know who that is. Coming, this is the first uh, appearance of Galactus or Galactus. I've heard it pronounced many ways over the years. See this? Copyright 1965. March 1966 issue. Stanley, Jack Kirby, Joe Sennett, Artie Sack. How did he get in here? Coming of Galactus. Introducing the sensational Silver Surfer. There's the, the Watcher. He's trying to protect him from uh, Silver Server and Galactus. Made a collage here. Some stuff. Yeah, there it is. First appearance. My journey has ended. This planet shall sustain me until it has been drained of all elemental life. So speaks Galactus. Next issue, prepare for wonderment without end. Marvels without measure. So speak Stan and Jack, enough said. Note, our letters section appears after. Yeah, they'd had a good business practice. They started publishing while well, they'd been doing this for a while, but there was Stan and pretty soon Stan's Soapbox. And some people got their name in. I joined MMMS, but never, well, you know, I don't know for a fact that my name was never in there. Robert Beatty would have been uh, Wichita, Kansas, probably at this time. We lived in Lawrence for a while. It's all good stuff. I bought this uh, Spider-Man pin up, and uh, there was uh, bubblegum cards. I bought enough bubblegum cards. I made a Spider-Man gluing them to a big piece of uh, cardboard. So pretty much like that, I think. Sergeant Fury, Tales to Astonish, Tales of Suspense, Strange Tales, Thor, Daredevil, X-Men, The Avengers, Spider-Man, Mighty Marvel Checklist. Well, if I sell them, then I'll sell them, and if not, I guess my kids will inherit them. I've got kids, grandkids, and great-grandkids. As far as I know, none of them are interested in comic books. But... We'll see what the future brings. I didn't make any money in the past when I probably had uh, good opportunities. Uh, I want to point out, oh, there's one other story. And I don't have the comic. At least I can't find it. I thought I still had it. 
1964, I think it was May, Batman and Detective started the new look, the yellow oval about uh, his chest. And uh, the stories were different. They were better stories. They weren't about space monkeys and stuff like that. So, uh, I think John Broom was the writer. And uh, anyway, Batman New Look. So you know what I did? That's something a dumb kid would do. I threw away my old Batmans. I threw them away. I had old Batman and Detective and World's Finest comics going back to the 1940s. I had 1940s, 1950s, up to 19, I think it was 64, the new look Batman. Well, that was just trash. They're probably decomposing in a landfill somewhere. Oh, well. We live long and live long enough to regret some of our mistakes, which at the time we didn't think were mistakes. I hope you do better.